Kersey's head floating in the toilet. Nothing better than a good <laughs> head toilet scene. <laughs> yeah, love it. Hello and welcome to today's special Canada Day edition of Frightfully Forgotten Horror Movies. We're going to be tackling another underrated Canadian horror movie, 1983's Curtains. That's right. But before we get started, what are we drinking? Today we're drinking Caprini Green Smoked Porter. <laughs> nice. John Vernon is in this and he was in tons of things, but little notably is uh, Animal House. Double secret probation. Killer clowns from outer space, we gotta mention. The much maligned Linda Thorson is in this. She was Tara King in The Avengers and took over Emma Peel's spot. Big shoes to fill. That's right, and did not fill them very well, I might add. <laughs> Samantha Egger is in this. She was in The Brood, another Canadian staple. Which we covered exactly one year to the date. That's right. Last year for Canada Day. <laughs> and Michael Wincott is in this briefly. Main protagonist, the bad guy in The Crow, and he was in the newer movie Nope. Curtain starts off with one of our main characters, Samantha. She's on stage and pulls out this gun and shoots it. Director's like, ah, oh, no, 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 <laughs> not good enough. Cut, pulling up to this big mansion and they go in and you find out that she's being committed to an insane asylum. Yeah. And you're like, well, what happened between first scene and now? They bring her in to see the doctor and he's like, well, she seems perfectly fine to me. And then, ah! <laughs> goes all crazy, like starts trying to kill the director. All these orderlies come in and they kind of put her in a straitjacket and find out that they're intentionally committing her method acting for this role for this director known as Striker. <laughs> <laughs> and you know he's gonna be an asshole with a name <laughs> like Striker. Yeah, right? exactly. So while she's in this insane asylum, re researching her role. Descending into madness. <laughs> herself, right? And then you find out that this Striker guy is now recasting this role as she's in the asylum. Oh uh, yeah, fucking asshole. Finds us out by getting this newspaper that says, you know, casting call for this movie and she's like what the fuck like, yeah, this in, is my role and i'm in here suffering <laughs> for this role and she escapes talking to this unknown person she's not the shot but saying basically i'm gonna get him as she's burning the pictures the the headshots of all the actresses you get introduced one by one to all these actresses that are gonna be auditioning one of the women is like laying in bed and this guy's coming in, he got the stocking <laughs> over his face, and he comes in yeah. and busts in, and you think he's gonna kill her, but it's her boyfriend, of course. No, oh, yeah. They're all role-playing. Role-playing, this Burton <laughs> Cummings looking <Yeah>. guy. <laughs> That's intentional, it has to be. Because later on she has this dream, and this Burton Cummings song is all yeah. playing. <laughs> comes up to this creepy doll. And the doll kind of like comes alive and like grabs right, yeah, her and everything. Oh. She's onto her. Then she wakes up. This person's in the house with this hag mask and kills her. We then slowly get introduced to all of the women in this movie as they arrive at Stryker's mansion to audition for this new role. <laughs> yeah, quote unquote yeah. audition. While everybody's sitting around the dinner table, start to learn a little bit about what makes these women tick and what each one of them are willing to do to get the role, right? Most of the things include sexual acts. <laughs> yeah. Which I'm sure Stryker is banking on, yeah. right? They notice that one of the girls is missing, actually. There's supposed to be six and there's only five. But Samantha shows up unannounced and it scares the shit out of Stryker. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he thought she was still locked up. She's got daggers in her eyes for this fucking striker. One of the girls goes skating the next day. Got a ghetto blaster, starts playing. It's that Bert and Cummings song. <laughs> I wonder how much they paid Bert to get that song in the movie. Probably tons. Fuck, they could have just paid me nothing. I would have done it. Yeah, you saved my beer. And she starts doing a bit of skating, and then the song stops. And she looks at the ghetto blaster. There's nobody there. And she looks behind, and there's somebody chasing after her on skates in that hag mask and pulls out a sickle. They get into the woods a little bit and there's a little bit of a cat and mouse and she leans up against a tree and ding! 
During one of the auditions with Stryker, Stryker grabs the hag mask. Well, how the hell did he get a hold of that? Throws it at Samantha. Make me want you. Yeah. <laughs> Make me love you. Yeah. Why does he have the hag mask? Mm -hmm. Brooke is lying on the bed in her high heels for some yeah, reason. Yeah. She gets up. I go to bed in high heels, <laughs> yeah, too, yeah. by the way. Every single night. Yeah. <laughs> Brooke gets up and goes and looks in the toilet and she sees Kersey's head floating in the toilet. Nothing better than a good <laughs> head toilet scene. Yeah, I love it. And she tells Stryker about it and Stryker goes up and looks and of course, there's no head in the toilet. She lays down a striker, <laughs> and then she all gets a striker, <laughs> like... <laughs> That one girl goes into her room, and then Stryker's <laughs> yeah. all in there smoking, and he's, he's all pleased with himself. <laughs> Somebody comes into the room with a gun, and that's where we're going to end it. So if you want to see what happens with Stryker, with this person with the hag mask, keep watching 1983's Curtains. Man. The mystery and misdirection of this movie is fantastic, and it yeah. gets you right from the beginning. First scene, and you have that little audition thing she's doing, and then it cuts to the insane asylum. You're instantly like, what happened? And there's so much misdirection in this movie too, right? They feed you a little bit from the start, and then those little clues and snippets that they give you show up. Yeah. throughout the movie yeah. later and later and later and they keep sort of popping up so it must be this person who's the killer yeah but it's not maybe yeah. it's somebody else right yeah. tons of misdirection with, yeah. with the hag mask there's lots of misdirection with that weird creepy toy mm. certain things are dreams the way the plot is structured too in this movie also it adds a little bit of misdirection to yeah it's weird it's like <laughs> it's like it's a slasher movie but it's not structured like a slasher whatsoever no it's structured like a play between acts yeah, yeah where where the movie is sectioned but it doesn't hurt the movie at all it actually no. plays for its yeah. benefit. The movie really starts off as more of a psychological horror. And then in the middle it turns into a slasher. Yeah. Kind of out of nowhere. Then it kind of goes back. Yeah, it's a neat flip how the movie changes mm -hmm. its style throughout the movie, which is interesting. Very original, actually. Yeah. It seems so out of left field, but yeah. in reality, it works better than a real slasher. Exactly, yeah. It feels more real life. The characters in this movie are fantastic. Stryker, as like, <laughs> of, even though he's not the slasher per se, he's kind of the main villain. Mm -hmm. You love to hate this guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, and you do, yeah. And he is so, like, from the moment you see him, you're like, oh, this fucking asshole. And he's then, just out for his own shit. And the way they write him, too, and the way he plays it, is perfect. Like, what an obnoxious, egotistical... Thinks he knows everything yeah. about acting, acting and <laughs> everything. is like, you're a director, you're not some acting coach, but he's bringing all these women in to like... Yeah. And you just hate him because you know he's just abusing his power. Right? Exactly, yeah. You get a real in-depth look into the souls of all these women too, right? And it's just strictly through dialogue. You learn what each woman is about by what they say they'll do and they'll do yeah yeah what they're going to do or what they're willing to do for this part and it's like really you're willing to go to these depths for yeah. something like this well then that shows what kind of a person you really are and then when it comes to audition time and striker is alone with these women and you see what each one of them does or doesn't do based on what they had said. It's very revealing of that character, right? Like there's yeah. a one character who's not really a traditional actor. She's a stand-up comedian. And she's basically telling them to fuck off. Like, I'm not doing that. Fuck you. You want to hire me? Hire me. Yeah, based but, on my merits. But I'm not fucking you. And he walks upstairs yeah. and there's Audrey. There's Audrey. <laughs> like, what the fuck? The music for this movie is fantastic, and it's done by legendary Canadian composer Paul Zaza, who's done lots of great Canadian horror movies. Lots of them we've covered. Yeah. Ghost Keeper, Prom Night. Prom what? Night 2? Prom Night 2, My Bloody Valentine, and the list goes on. Yeah, it's actually pretty crazy, all yeah. the prominent shit he's done. Yeah, and he's a great composer. He composes every scene perfectly. He gives each movie its own little soul. The kills in this movie are really good. But it's not the kills themselves. It's not like yeah. it's a gory type kill. No, because you see very little of the kill itself. It's the lead up. It's the 
tension building and the suspense that leads up to the kill is what makes it so brilliant. That's right, yeah. There's that skating scene where it's long and drawn out, right? A lot of it is the tension because you see the skates, so somebody else is there, obviously. Yeah. It's not her, it's not Kirsty. Pans up, you see the hag mask, it's like, yeah. oh shit! Then she pulls out that fucking sickle and it's yeah. like scary as hell. And the way it's shot too. It's actually like a beautiful scene because mm -hmm. when Kirsty is just practicing her skating, it's a beautiful scene. It's all, it's all yeah. snow. It's shot really well. There's that Burton Cummings song and you're kind of just enjoying watching her skate. It turns into something you know is going to have a bad ending, which starts with a beautiful type scene. It's I like the contrast there, right? Between yeah. the beauty and the horror. It's something that this movie does really yeah. well. And the way it's shot too, like slow motion, the skating. Obviously they took their time to like put the tracking on the, the rink to be able to track the skating perfectly. Like just to think I was watching it, like the preparation it took to do these shots. Probably took days. Yeah, it would have been really intense. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it pays off like crazy. Yeah. Just like the ballet scene with the other girl, she's practicing her ballet moves. Again, it's very beautiful. She's doing something artistic. Mm -hmm. You're enjoying watching her do her moves. And then out of nowhere, she gets killed. And it's like this contrast with this beauty and this awful thing happening to her. Very fittingly, final act is amazing. It's incredible. Uh, and it goes on forever. Like there's a huge chase scene and the setting for it too, which is extremely fitting, is like a backstage prop department. department yeah. yeah, for a play. So many things that pop out at you. There's so many vivid colors. There's yeah. so many mannequins yeah, and it's... creepiness. Then you've got this cat and mouse chase between the killer and the victim yeah. too, right? It's great. It's fantastic. It's just fantastic. That is one of many great settings. The insane asylum is a great setting in this. Stryker's Mansion, another great setting. The wilderness around. In the winter. Yeah. So if you want to run away, you can only run away so far before you freeze to death. Yeah. Then the last setting at the end of the props department. Couldn't get any better. That's right, yeah. And then the movie doesn't quite end there though either, right? There's still more. You think that that's the end. Yeah. The, you, the final chase scene. You, you think know? it's gonna end yeah. there, but not quite. And then you get more of a twist to the plot yeah. and more of a reveal. So the the movie just keeps giving and giving yeah. and giving, right? Obviously it has some commentary on some social issues, especially to do with Hollywood. Yeah. And probably the 80s and probably even today too, of course, this probably stands true is the what, casting couch. What women have to go through to get parts in Hollywood. Like, yeah, Stryker having all these women at his mansion to get a part and they're talking about what they have to do to get it. Well, that's obvious. Mm -hmm in your face commentary on the Hollywood system. And people abusing yeah. the power, right, that they have. Yeah, and not just that, not even the newcomers, but then what happens is someone who's already made it, like Samantha's character, she's already a star, but she's getting older. Stryker doesn't want her anymore, right? So it's like, yeah, you have a shelf life as a woman in Hollywood. That's mm -hmm. commentary on that. And I think the hag mask is commentary on that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The old woman is getting her revenge. I'm too old for you now. The hag mask was used in a few movies prior to this. In The Comeback, 1978. Which we covered. The hag tight mask was used in uh, Terror Train at all. But neither of those were as effective as this movie. Like, it's, yeah. it's used so much more effectively here. You get a more poignant sense of why it's being used. That's not even your grandma's face either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when trick-or-treating is me and uh, Mark, Mark Mitchell. Mitchell. Yeah, with that. <laughs> that old man mask. And my grandma was flipping through pictures once and she's like, what's wrong with my face in that picture? It's like, that's, that's a mask, grandma. That's not you. And we're going to keep drinking for Canada today to celebrate. You keep drinking too. We just won't go as crazy as we did last year when he entered that <laughs> drinking competition with Saskatchewan. Well, you dislocated your liver. With one minute remaining in the second round, both Canadians are landing some incredible combinations, but neither has been able to seize the advantage. Justin's down. He's hurt. What a blow for Winnipeg. If he can't continue, they will have to forfeit, and the Winnipeg team will lose the points they have earned so far. Pop it! Pop it! Pop it! No, no, listen, Justin here. Your liver's dislocated. We can't let you go on. No! Right, coach? No! Adam! 
Pop it! Shit at him! Pop it! Justin, you can't go on. Do it! Do it! Do it! Tape it! Tape it! If I loud it's over, I can hold him up for 30 seconds! Tape it! Now there's just 30 seconds left on the clock. If he can hold on, he keeps the points and Winnipeg is still in it. Put your liver somewhere else. Let your liver go. There is no liver. Justin drinks and scores with a beautiful backswing. Yeah! The buzzer sounds and that's the end of the match. Justin Bush, injured liver and all, has defeated Saskatoon and managed to keep Winnipeg's hopes alive. If you want a great Canadian horror movie to watch on Canada Day, well, look up Curtains. It's fantastic. Yeah. It's one of the better slashers that come out of Canada. And there's lots that came out of Canada that are great. But this one stands above, really. And it's very well done. And original. And until next time, keep drinking. Keep drinking.